Welcome back to another episode of Be Our Guest here on Musical Theatre Radio. I am your host, as always, Jean-Paul Yovanov. Today we are going to be speaking with the creators and the producer behind the musical Fly More Than You Fall. Uh, we play some of the songs on the station from this show and they sound great. And I think the show deserves to get known by more people. So that's why we're going to have them on and talk to them today. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome producer Mark Levine from uh, his second time around. So it's good to see you again, Mark, on the show and creators Eric Holmes and Nat Zegri. Nat, Eric, Mark, welcome to the show. Thank you. John Paul. Awesome. It's great to have you guys on. Um, I start every one of my show the same way. We want to get to know you a little bit better. Now we, we know Mark, our listeners know Mark already, but Eric and Nat, we don't know you yet. So Eric, who is Eric Holmes in 30 seconds? Your 30 second bio. Wow, he's uh, extremely aggressive, deeply loves musical theater and uh, the West Wing. Uh, He writes for television, he writes for film, he writes for theater. Uh, And yeah, I think that pretty much covers it. Nice, so on the, okay, on the West Wing, who are you? Are you Toby? Uh, No, I am, although I wish, I'm probably more (laughs) Sam Seaborn uh, than I am, am. Toby or Josh. Josh. Got to love Josh. Okay. Yeah. Good answer. Good answer. All right. Nat, 30 seconds. Who are you? This is so tough. Uh, well, he, he is a less aggressive, uh, <laughs> also deeply loves musical theater, really enjoys the West Wing. Um, uh, and I, I, I'm, a, I'm a free, happy little spirit that was put here on this earth for reasons unknown and undefined, but I'm just kind of going along with the journey and seeing where it takes me. And I absolutely love art, expression, music. And uh, that's pretty much what makes me, me. And therefore, that's what I have to offer to the world. (laughs) Nice, very nice. (laughs) And Mark, we know who you are, but you have 15 seconds, because we already know who you are. Who who are you in 15 seconds? Who am I? Someone who's always loved musical theater and has always hoped that one of these wonderful theater shows that I've seen would be the one that I would want to take on as my own. And when I went to Utah to meet these guys and see their show, that was it. Love at first view on the stage. Awesome. (laughs) But Mark, do you like the West Wing? Oh, yeah. I love the West Wing. I don't know which character I am. (laughs) Which character am I on the West Wing? Just wanted to make sure. (laughs) Absolutely. All right. Well, before we get to you, Mark, and your involvement, we, we're going to get to to know um, Eric and, and Nat and, and how they got together, first of all. So who wants to take it, Eric or Nat? How did you guys get together as, as a writing team? Um, we, uh, we met, uh, gosh, uh, almost 10 years ago uh, when I was uh, workshopping a, a musical I wrote with someone else uh, at Indiana University, which is where I went. And uh, Nat was had just finished his freshman year there, was starting his sophomore year. Um, so uh, he was in it. He was the only musical theater kid. Everyone else was an opera major. So you can imagine as a book writer, uh, there was one cast member I really was taken with. Uh, the rest of them really struggled with uh, talking. So uh, right away I was drawn to him. Uh, and not just because he was, uh, the only musical theater kid. He actually has talent. Um, so we kind of just became friends uh, is really how it started. Uh, there was no collaboration in mind at all. We just liked each other. We thought each other were strange, bizarre humans. And then uh, over, you know, we talk every four or five months, you know, and then uh, I needed music written for a play I was writing that was ever so slightly inspired by uh, the Gershwin brothers. And um, and I was like, this is a hard challenge. If you can do it, do it. If not, don't stress about it. And of course he did it. And uh, and then I was like, how do you feel about writing musicals? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it pretty much hits the nail on the head. It really, yeah, it came from us being two people along with Eric's wife, Erin, really three people in an environment where we didn't really know a lot of people. We, it was it was kind of unfamiliar. And uh, we found each other and we were kind of uh, these, these buoys for each other in an ocean of unfamiliarity. And then of course that, that did develop into a, 
into the friendship and the working relationship that we have now. And, and, uh, but yeah, it was, it started very casually. And then all of a sudden we realized there was a lot of potential for creation between the two of us. And that's when we just kind of buckled our seatbelts and went on the ride. So Eric, what were you at uh, school for? Uh, I, I went to school uh, for theater, uh, for, I guess that was my major. Yeah, for theater. Uh, and uh, I started thinking I'd be an actor. And then uh, halfway through college, just uh, started directing and writing and uh, never really looked back. I mean, I was in one god awful production of Sweet Charity and <laughs> swore to myself I would never be put in a position where. Uh, I was I had to perform in a show that was that but like I knew I could make the show better yeah. but when you're just a chorus kid you're not allowed to talk and I thought no I that's not the part of this industry I'm interested in at all like I want to be able to make it better I, I I watched that show get worse every day at rehearsal and it <laughs> killed me so yeah all right and, and that what were you at school for I was a BFA musical theater major at Indiana University okay. as well um, which is just kind of where I landed because I, I really liked to do a little bit of everything when it came to the entertainment industry. I enjoyed being on stage, I enjoyed acting and performing, but I also enjoyed creating, being behind the table, writing, leading, music directing, and as well as just uh, kind of doing my own thing as well. Not necessarily trying to fit the role that someone else had written, but uh, create my own styles of performance and kind of one man shows. Uh, very educationally based in many ways. And so when I went to IU, uh, my, my major definitely didn't define me as I started to uh, branch out into a bunch of different directions, uh, which is something that I still uh, can't quite ever, you know, nail down today. There's always something else that is interesting to me or something, whether or not I'm capable of doing it. But that's, that's what led me to IU because they fostered such a, a great, atmosphere of of supporting me in those endeavors you know there's a lot of musical theater programs that that give you the cookie cutter and say you're going to be a musical theater star or you mean nothing to us <laughs> yeah. and I very much went to IU saying look I'm okay with being a musical theater star but I'd really like to try a bunch of these other things too and they were like great that's awesome. Fantastic. We've got the best music school in the world right next door with the Jacobs School of Music. So, uh, so yeah, it was a, it was a great place to be able to kind of, uh, realize that you don't have to be pigeonholed. You can, you can kind of do whatever you want. Nice. And you really shouldn't. I mean, I'm always amazed more programs don't say, yeah. okay, here's the musical theater stuff, but also here's how to be a TV actor so you can actually make money. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Like, Wait, are, are you so... saying there's no money in musical theater? Yeah, so. <laughs> what? So, I was reading something recently where they were just talking about, uh, well, I was reading the history, you know, like, you know, back in the day, you know, musical could take a year from creation to stage. You know, nowadays it's 10 years at least. And it's like, no wonder, you know, most of the musicals are just rehashes of movies from the 80s because the studios have the money to pump into it and pay the writers. Otherwise, writers are going to run off and and get paid for their work right. because when you're doing a music a musical you're not paid until that curtain goes up like your option but it's next to nothing you know like so you're not really paid until the curtain goes up and if you have to wait 10 years for that paycheck you can't survive on that i mean like when broadway reopens people need to start rethinking broadway that's yep. a that's going to be really crucial yeah because cool. uh, the direction it's going in is already so unbelievably commercial Mm -hmm. Even now, seeing with the the TikTok musicals rising yeah. in popularity, it's it's really gonna you know much like many pillars in this country that we need to start rethinking. I think Broadway is one of them <laughs> in many ways. Yeah, yeah. So the two of you met at, at this show. What what was the first thing you you uh, worked on together and 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 wrote? And how, what was that like for the two of you working together? Was it easy? Was it just was it more difficult than you thought? Yeah, well, Eric Eric kind of alluded to it, but it was exactly, it was this play that Eric had written where yeah. uh, within the play, there needed to be a song written because the play was about, mm -hmm. Eric, stop me if I'm overstepping, but the play yeah. was about two, two brothers, Polish brothers, who moved to uh, the United States uh, during World War II to kind of escape 
uh, before World War II. Before yeah. World War II starts, and they're songwriters, and he needed a song to be written that is a big hit. But the the twist on it was it, it needed to be a song where if you replace one word from the song with another word, it all of a sudden becomes a Christmas song. And that was the very niche and unique challenge that Eric brought to me. And he said, can you do this? And within, I think, a couple hours, I had sent back uh, the full song yeah. being like, yep. Yeah. yeah, it was, I mean, it was, yeah, I, I was, I like screamed at my wife, like, get the fuck in here. You won't believe what he just did. So like, because uh, it was, it just sounded me because I, I needed them to, they, it's, the word was mama to Christmas and because the idea is Poland is invaded, their mom is in danger, and yet they sell out their own Jewish heritage for money. And you know, is that and that's that's what kicks the show off. Like that's the first fifteen minutes of the show. Um, so um, the fact that he pulled that off was really impressive. But we didn't really start writing musicals until a few months after, because he was still in college. You know, so he came out because uh, I was producing the Lily Awards and he came out to help with that. And um, we were incredibly inspired listening to all the powerhouse women of Broadway give speeches all night. And, uh, and we had this idea for a musical that was a feminist take on the emperor's clothes. Uh, and, uh, and I'd written an outline uh, because Nat originally said, no one's done the Emperor's New Groove. And I said, because Disney owns it and we're not gonna get those rights. So I said, but no one has the rights to the Emperor's clothes. We could do our own take on that. And so I, we had an outline, but that's all we had. And so while he was in town for a few days, we sat down, uh, he had some musical ideas and started playing. And then I said, well, what about this? Well, what about this? And you know, by the end of the week, we had nine songs, I think it was, the easiest thing in the world. It was the easiest thing in the world because he was staying with us. And so we'd wake up in the morning and I'd make coffee and he'd play the piano and we would literally fuck around just to have fun, you know, and just to make the other, and it's a comedy. So the game was just who can make the other one laugh the most, yeah. which usually got really raunchy. You just, kept winning. <laughs> you just kept winning the game. That was the yeah. thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's how it really started. And then it really... It was really just kind of like, why wouldn't you want to do this? This is so fun. Like, there, it's not work. It's just two idiots fooling around, you know? Nice. Yeah. All right. Well, now that you we've found out how you work together and, and you well, work well together, it seems, let's, let's move to uh, Fly More Than You Fall. Uh, tell us a little bit about it. Tell us the synopsis of it first, and then we'll learn a little bit more about the process. Uh, sure. Nat, do you want to do it? Synopsis. Well, you do the synopsis. And then okay. Kind of... So Fly More Than You Fall is a story about uh, a teenage girl who aspires to be a writer and all the big dreams that come along with that. But it's kind of um, put on pause when her mom is diagnosed with cancer. But she uses the writing and the story she'd already begun to navigate herself through grief, through growing up, through feeling alone and eventually gets herself at least uh, on track to continue and move forward by the end of the story. So it's got a lot of ups and downs. It's got a lot of humor. It's got an overwhelming amount of heart to it, but it's, it's the story of a young woman uh, coping with grief as best she can. Yeah. And really where it came from uh, was these shared personal experiences that that Eric and I have, which really bonded uh, both of us to each other really in the first place, um, in that we both have parents that we've lost. Mm -hmm. You know, Eric lost his mom when he was young, and I lost my dad when I was young. And by young, I mean formative young adult years. And And that was something that was extremely passionate to us because the, the 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 process of grief is such a complicated process particularly for people who have never experienced it in the way the others have 
And then uh, conversely, for people who have experienced it, who don't know how to share that experience with, with others. And really that's where the crux of the story comes from. Now the actual show came from us realizing some another project we were working on was not working the way that we wanted it to work. And from that project actually came this idea of, oh my gosh, this is how we tell the story that we're wanting to tell with, uh, with right. you know, someone dealing with grief. Because Fly More Than You Fall, the song, actually has been around for many years before the musical was written. Fly More Than You Fall is a song that I wrote before ha I had even moved to New York. And it was just that. It was simply a personal pop song that kind of explained my view on life. And eventually Eric called one day and said, I've got it, it's, your, it's Fly More Than You Fall. It's your song. Because we, we had been working on this project. We couldn't quite crack exactly where it was gonna go past the development we had already worked on for it. And we were kind of at this place where we weren't sure what to do. And then that was it, kind of the light bulb moment of yeah. it's, it's fly more than you fall. And, and the show really started to get pieced together from there. Yeah, one of the big issues uh, with grief is is we don't talk about it as a society as a whole, um, and and when you're a child and going through it, and the adults are refusing to talk about it because that's just how we deal with things in our society. We suppress our emotions. Um, you feel like you're going crazy. I mean, it was like losing a parent is scary, but then thinking you're losing your mind on top of it is it's debilitating Not so we we wanted to create a story that said to children and to adults for that matter you're okay you're going to be okay you know we're not saying stop feeling the horrible feelings you're feeling we're saying there will come a day where it dissipates mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. and so i that's what was really uh motivating to write this not to, to mention as eric just kind of said it it creates then the conversation that so many people are not having yeah. mm -hmm. you know as eric just said it it it's a conversation that people not necessarily don't want to have but don't know how to have because no no human ever wants to start an engagement with someone that is filled with such sadness and negativity, you know what I mean? That's just not inherently what humans wanna do with each other when it comes to connection. They don't wanna bring other people down by letting them into their sadness. And yeah. yet that's the true way that people are going to get through something like that. And so it's, 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 it's a lesson, not only that, at least for me personally, speaking just for myself, it's a lesson that I think is so, so important for everyone around the world to hear, but it's also self-reflective in many ways. It's the lessons that I needed to be learning. It's the lessons that I needed to be ingesting. It's, it's, the, it's the things that I needed to confront that I hadn't, still haven't, and, and, and still need to, you know what I mean? So there's a wow. very therapeutic sort of element to not only the creation, but the result of what we see when it finally comes to fruition. Yeah, that's what's great about being a writer is you get to write the story you need to see that mm -hmm. you, you know, like that's, you know, it's, it's just mumbling. convenient, oh, convenient might not be the right word, but it, you know what I mean when I say it's convenient that millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of people around the world have felt the same exact thing, you know, and that's what people need to remember as well as you're not you're not alone in a lot of these things that you're feeling and, and through the communication and, and witnessing and understanding empathy, that's where you're gonna find results. Nice. Yeah. So you've got the title song, you've got the outline, the concept. How long did it take you to, to work it all out or at least work it all out enough to get it on its feet and on stage in front of an audience? And then how was that when oh. once it got on stage? Th those are two different questions. <laughs> how yeah, long did yeah. it take to write the show? A couple weeks. Wow. Uh, how long did it take to get someone to put it on a stage? <laughs> years. Years. Literally years. Yeah. And people would hear it and love it. And we'd do a reading and we'd do a this and we'd do a that. And then we'd get a theater to do it, but they, they're booked for a year and a half. So you can finally get on. You know, like it's, it's 
I don't, I, I love the theater maybe more than most things in the universe. And yet I wonder constantly why we do it because it's like, it's, it's not nice to you. It's like, it's an abusive relationship constantly. Um, but it's so worth it when you do finally get to see it. When we did uh, the first version in Syracuse uh, in a tiny black box, uh, I knew immediately we had something. And we did a lot of rewrites. The show's not even remotely close to that version. But I knew we had something because full grown men were sobbing all around me in the audience. Um, and then we got to go again in Utah. And the same thing, the audience, the huge theater, was just, you could feel it. It was group catharsis. Like I haven't felt all that often in a theater. I mean, it was, I was shocked, you know, like I was shocked. Yep. Well, you know what? Let's bring Mark back into it. He's been sitting patiently, he's been sitting quietly, which is great. But Mark, how did you hear about the show and, 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 and your journey to join the, the two of these guys? Sure. Uh, one of my former uh, employees is a, as an actor. I work with a lot of actors in New York providing staffing for parties, cater waiters. And when a lot of actors and actresses move to New York, their first stop until they make it big is cater waitering. So mm -hmm. I've had this cater waiter business for 30 some odd years. And about 15 years ago, actually one of our cater waiters, former cater waiters teaches drama at Syracuse, okay. was involved with it at Syracuse, then was brought on board the cast in, at the, in the Utah, and he posted about it on social media that he was involved with this beautiful show that started at Syracuse, that he was, being, he was flying out to join the cast in Utah. And then he started posting some articles that had appeared about it in the local papers that were incredibly exciting. Is Fly More the next Broadway hit? Is this the next year Evan Hansen? Is this, you know, comparing it to such beautiful shows and shows that I absolutely love that it just triggered in my mind. And I, and I had read that the guys, uh, that Eric and I both went to Indiana University, which coincidentally, I also went to for two years, freshman and sophomore year. So it just, was seemed like the right time and the right show for me to kind of, I haven't been to Utah, I haven't been to Salt Lake City since I was a young kid. So it just kind of made sense for me to take that journey for a weekend to see what this was all about. And the first night I, I loved it. Um, looking around, like Eric said, the audiences were just from eight to 80, men, women, children, grandparents, grandkids were all resonant. They were all relating to the story. And then going back the second night and seeing it again and falling more in love with the music. The first night I listened in, in, in the story and then putting, putting it all together, it just, there's, there's something there. These guys are incredibly, incredibly talented and, and over COVID, I've got to learn even more about the guys as I got exposed to more and more of their, the projects that they've been working on together. And they're just, they're just great. And, and Nat did a talk back after the Saturday evening performance. And it was just, again, hearing the audience question them about the creative process and talk to Nat and Nat's passion and Eric's passion about the show and there's the story that they created because they've lived it is just really special. And thus my desire to, you know, take this on. And I'm so grateful to the two of them for having the trust in me to kind of, to, to gear this, to drive this down the path, path or climb up that mountain to use an analogy from the show because we don't know what's on the top of that mountain. We don't know what awaits, but might, you know, hopefully not like Malia, our wings are not broken. Our wings are strong. And this is a strong show that's getting stronger with all the people that are involved with it now and that are going to be involved with it in the future. Yeah. <clears throat> so Eric and Nat, what was it like when uh, Mark came up to you? <laughs> He's seen the show twice. He's flown in from New York. 
<laughs> what was that moment like? Was it a little surreal or was it like, yeah, I knew this was going to happen? Uh, wow, Nat. Well, yeah, because I, I got to meet Mark first. Mark and I got to have a lovely meal uh, together outside in, in, uh, outside in Utah um, right before the show. And just sitting there getting to know Mark and I, you know, I, I, I kind of deal very quickly with human connection. I love connecting with humans quickly and I know very quickly whether or not uh, I have a positive connection with someone or if it's uh, maybe just not meant to be. Mark was definitely one of those people. It was just good energy, positive energy and the aura was nothing but lovely uh, the entire meal. And I, I kept thinking to myself, I was like, I almost forgot at times that I was there with our potential lead producer, you know, who who we hadn't even really discussed the show at length yet because I just thought to myself, first and foremost, ah, oh, I'm just having a great dinner with this new this new guy that I'm meeting. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then we went to work and we did the show and he watched the show and we got to talk afterwards. And I saw the enthusiasm within Mark that Eric and I had always discussed, if, if we're ever gonna have anyone on this team, no matter what position they're in, the passion needs to be there mm -hmm. for the actual material, for the actual you know, meaning of what this is. We're not just looking for someone who has dollar signs in their eyes. Yeah. You know, It's important quality, but it can't be the leading quality. And I found that in Mark very quickly and that his passion for this was, was genuine, his passion for the story to be told, the connection to the story, all of it. That's all I needed. That's really all I needed. I, you know, on the first night I thought to myself, yeah, this guy, he's, he's just, he's one of us. He's on the team. He's, he's there for it. And he was and uh, continues to be. So I, I always knew. And especially because in Mark, you know, this this is it's it's a new journey for all of us you know this is this is mark's first i'm sure mark can speak on this way more than i but it's mark's first time really taking this position it's eric and i's first time really getting to this level of a, of the journey that we're on with our musical so so i love the idea that we're all you know learning and 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 going together you know you've always heard the kind of expression like who's driving the bus you know and like, I think to myself, if I were a kid on a school bus and Mark was my bus driver, I'd be happy to go to school in the morning. I'd be, I'd be okay waking up at 6.30, you know? And I don't think you can say that about a lot of people. So that's, <laughs> that's how, I, how I feel about it. Anyway. That, that is the description I want Mark you to use somewhere. Being described as a bus driver. Is there any way to <laughs> quote? <laughs> All right. That's going to be my opening night gift to them, little buses, and they're not going to understand why I'm giving like, them little school that? buses. No, 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 Mark, you have to hire a stretch bus for our opening <laughs> night party, but you have to drive. <laughs> oh my God. So actually, I'm going to practice today. I'm going to go down and drive my parents' car around the parking lot of their complex. <laughs> and when you don't see me on a call next week, you'll, you'll know why. There we go. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, You've got the show. You've got Mark going down to see the show. You've got the lead producer. Uh, we got a good nucleus of a show. Where's it going now? What? What? You you put it in the, uh, Utah. What's happened to the show now? Where's it going? What's it, What's it doing? That's a, that's a that's a great question. That's a great question. Now that vaccines have started hap rolling out in all around the country and and here in New York people are getting more excited and open to having the conversations of where, what theater is gonna, what the future is for theater, mm -hmm. right? Regional theaters, I feel, are going to open up a little bit quicker. Um, New York is being a little, I guess, conservative and regional theaters will open up. Theaters are open to having the conversation with us and have been reaching out to us, asking us, to share information about Flymore nice. and to map out a plan that will start with us being at regional theaters um, outside of New York. And hopefully that'll start, hopefully we'll have our first regional theater in place by the end of this year, maybe fall of 2021. 2021. And similar to other musicals, I'd like to do a few regional theater runs on the way to New York and mm -hmm. let the world see what these two guys have created, what Eric and I have created. And then 
you know, I would love to be in broad, on Broadway by 2023. Hopefully when theater is more open, when tourists are coming back to New York, when my mom and dad feel comfortable going to the theater again. Yeah. And, you know, I think that's what's in store for us. Uh, we have a, a beautiful show that is constantly being made better and better and better by these, by these guys. And Mark has done an amazing job lining up uh, interviews with some really fantastic female directors, uh, a lot of women of color. Uh, and I mean, just interview after interview, we're excited, we're inspired. Um, and, and we can't wait until we one have a theater so we can finally book one of them uh, to direct it. But then, you know, then it's off to the races and it's rewrites and um, just building this show as strong as possible every time. Because yeah, and it's, been a very, it's, it's been very exciting that, you know, a lot of directors have been reaching out to us as they hear more and more about the story about these guys Mm -hmm. And directors, again, as my first time as a lead producer, I don't have an, you know, an open line to all the, the directors. So it's been interesting to hear some of these directors reach out to us, us reach out to them, because it's very important to Eric Nat and myself. And it's always been, look, I just got involved with Eric and Nat about a year ago, but they, as I said, they've been working on the show a long time, that this show is representative of the story of the world that we live in um, of new voices um, mm -hmm. and it's important for all of us we're all very much on that same uh, on the same bus to, to use a bus analogy yeah. that the creative team that our investors that our producers really reflect this this story which is about a mother and a daughter and a, a young girl and just it's it's a universal story. And we want our creative team and the people that join the, the people that get on the bus, eventually I'll, I'll, I'll lose the bus analogy, but now, now I got my own. <laughs> that the people that get on our bus to feel the same way as us. Yeah. Because that'll make a stronger show and that'll make a show on Broadway and, and regionals and in Canada, we hope to be Look, Come From Away started in Canada. It's yeah. Come From Away is a beautiful, beautiful show. Yeah. That this is a worldwide type show that audiences around yeah. the world, from Saudi Arabia to Salt Lake City, from yeah. 8 to 80, are going to fall in love with. Yeah. And they're going to fall Well, in one love of the best parts of the Utah production was the design team, because mm -hmm. not only were they talented, but they were passionate about the show. And they would give, you know, feedback uh, here and there while rehearsing that, Nat and I are always open to listening to and using. And what was your experience when you lost someone? What did you get like ever, you know, like we're very big on the collaboration. Yeah, definitely. It, the future, the, I mean, it's really just about time. That's the unknown component for everyone. Yeah. For everyone right now, obviously for the world, you know, I, there's, there's no, there's no doubt that fly more than you fall will be a raging success in many different places. If the real question is just about when, because there, of course there's the real conversation that needs to be had before we have the conversation of, you know, what's the next step for Fly More Than You Fall? The real conversation is what, what is the next step for theater? Yeah. You know, how do we get theaters even in a place where they're financially able to produce new shows, you know? Right. I feel like people need to prepare themselves for a lot of Annie's, a lot of the Wizard of Oz, yep. is, a lot of Beauty and the Beasts, because yeah. you got to get those money makers in when theater right. returns, in order for theaters to be able to say, "Yeah, now let's bring this new story." Because let's let's be honest, it's always a financial risk, yeah. especially if your the name of the show is in Mean Girls. Yeah, you know, right? Everyone and we already knows. we went down the path on this show with two or three other shows I'm working on, uh, where everyone has already quickly said, "Okay." theater is going to take forever make it a movie make right. it a tv special yeah. right you know like everyone's already not putting any hope because we know we're 40th in line behind Grease and Annie and you know every musical of the past 50 years is yeah. before right. us We've, you've got the the show you've got the lead producer you've got everything for this incredible um show 
where do you see it uh, going from there? How close is it to being complete? I, because I, I talked to Mark before. Are are you about 60, 70, 80, 90 percent complete? Do you think? Is there some rewrites and how how does it feel right now? I think that's I always, hard to say. Yeah, yeah, I always tend to look at it. Let me put, try to phrase it this way: I, uh, a show is never complete. Yeah, you know, a show is never complete, and therefore I I, I never put any sort of percentage on a project like that, yeah. unless you're genuinely like, we've written one song, then yeah, you probably <laughs> five percent. Yeah, but no, I agree. So it keeps yeah. evolving, you know, it could be opening night on broad, the night before opening night on Broadway and we decide to put it, you know, a la Fiddler, like yeah. it, and anything could change the night before. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, so I feel, I feel as if we have a hundred percent of a show and a hundred percent of that show is great. Yeah. We might take 6% out and then do something else with it at some point. But that yeah. doesn't mean I think that the show's never, never done because it, it, it is in, in many ways full and complete as it is. Yeah, We're it's just, interesting. I've never that. heard people, yeah, I've never heard people use yeah. percentage to describe completion of a show uh, until we started uh, uh, this process, not just with Mark, but with other producers before this moment, uh, because you use that to say how much is written. 75% is written. We have the second half of act two to write, yeah. you know, like that's, that's what you use a percentage for. Yeah. Whereas like when a show is written, when you're holding 135 pages in your hand, you know, and a score, you, that's a hundred percent done. Now yeah. you may not like some of it, <laughs> but I can also go back in time. I can go back on almost any show on Broadway and tell you, no, you're 80% there. <laughs> no, but like, it's yeah. 80% there to me. That's not 80% there to their fans. It's 110% to their fans. You know, so I always find that to be a weird way to gain, like, we have a show. Yeah. Now it's going to continue to change and to grow uh, simply because uh, the world will change and grow. I mean, th there could be giant events in the world that make us shift this or shift that, or, you know, who knows, and we're going to bring in a female director. She's going to change a lot. I guarantee you that. And I, we can't wait for that. You know, like we're right. thrilled about that option. You know, we're going to cast actors who are going to bring new things to it. Like there was a role in Utah that was almost it wasn't completely different, but it was tailored to the actor because the actor had certain strengths. Yeah. And so we just rewrote it to that. And then as soon as the show was done, we reverted the role back to more what we wanted it to be, you know? And, mm -hmm. we're, you know, that's kind of what's fun about being a writer and collaborating with actors is you get to do that. So when we get our original Broadway cast, you're going to see a different show just because exactly. they're going to show us different parts of the characters we hadn't seen before. Right. And especially because we keep, as Eric was saying earlier, when when we bring new people in, not even just in the cast, but we we find new experiences and new reactions and and new perspectives, and say, you know what, that 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 one little line right there might be a little bit out of date, or this one little emotional reaction, I feel something completely different. It's just all you always have to leave that door open to have to change something and be able to evolve. You know, if we find out in 2022 that there is an unearthed, you know, never before seen autobiography by Adolf Hitler called Flying More Than You Are Falling, we'll probably change the name. We'll you know what I mean? Like, yeah, <laughs> like it's, it's it we'll, <laughs> you just gotta be ready for anything because yeah. that's what art is. Art well, and is Broadway shows is change themselves. Like yeah. Wicked is, Wicked ch went through many rewrites after it opened yeah. because they put the, put it out on tour and realized, oh, this is better. Let's add it. Or they did the West End version and found some rewrites they liked, some different lyrics, right. some different lines. Every show on Broadway is kind of, that's what's kind of cool. Of it. It's not on film forever. Yeah, you know, right. like and film even film. then. Because like ask ask George Lucas is, <laughs> is is the original Star Wars 100% done yet George are we going to have six more versions before you finally feel complete you know <laughs> right right <laughs> nice <laughs> well guys I want to thank you all all three of you for for coming on and, and talking to me today and and introducing the audience to uh, a future hit you know no matter where it is whether it's in New York 
it's London or it's Topeka, Kansas, you know, or anything else, it, whether it's big or small, I think you, you, you've created. Or Canada, or Canada. Or Canada. Um, or Canada. <laughs> well, I figured you'd know Topeka, Kansas better than you would Barry, Ontario. So that's why I threw that one out there. I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> well, Toronto, if it can come to Toronto, that's where I am. I, I would love to see Great. it at some point. And even if it isn't, I might have to travel down to New York or wherever. Good. Look, if the show gets to open in Kansas, that's a big dream for me because then eventually the show will close and it will have to leave. Yeah. And I'll be able to tell all my fans that, uh, no, I don't think we're in Kansas anymore. <laughs> wow. Thank wow. you. That's Thank a you, long Scott. walk for a short payoff. <laughs> I, don't mean to, I, don't mean to, I don't mean to throw Kansas under the bus, but... The bus, uh, the bus. The bus is, is that better, is that a better payoff? Yeah. You, you had the audience until the joke. <laughs> John Paul, thank you very much for the opportunity to <laughs> talk to you and to share this show with your listeners. Um, all the musicals you work with, I'm sure, appreciate it. Matt, Eric, and I certainly appreciate it very much. And uh, yeah. we look forward to you sitting in the audience one night and watching their this beautiful show. Oh, as do I, as do I. So uh, Eric, Matt, um, Mark, again, thank you so much and congratulations on the show. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. No problem. All right, we were just speaking with Eric Holmes, Matt Zigri, and Mark Levy, producer and creators of uh, Fly More Than You Fall. Tune in next week as we speak to another guest or guest whose life, love, and passion is musical theater. Until next time, I am Jean-Paul Yovanoff. And I'll see you when I see you.